Well, since Easter, we have been focusing on being like Jesus. You know, it's not a bad thing to be like Jesus. In fact, we want Jesus to be our example, and following his example, we're supposed to, well, we're supposed to be followers of Jesus, those who would follow him, his example, so that we would become more Christ-like, more like Jesus, day by day, more like him. So far, we've seen that we should serve like Jesus. We've seen that we ought to pray like Jesus. Well, today I'd like to take us in a a little different direction because we're supposed to love like Jesus. You can't be Christ-like unless you love like Jesus. And I know it's a familiar idea. We'll give it just a little bit of a twist this morning. So don't fall asleep on me. Okay, Mike? Okay. Okay. If Ron starts to nod, you have my permission to elbow him too. Okay, all right. So we're going to talk about Jesus and his love. We want to be like Jesus. Let's pray though. Father, thank you for giving us your word and your truth. Help us, Lord, not to be hearers only, but doers. Those who would apply your word in a way that makes a difference in our world. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Our goal as Christians should be to become more like Christ Jesus daily, more like him uh, in, in every way that we can. Uh, remembering our April memory verse doesn't hurt any. If we say that we belong to Jesus, if the one who says he abides in him ought to walk in the same manner as he also walked. We ought to walk like Jesus, to live like Jesus, to be like Jesus. First John 2, 6 is a good verse to remember. If you say that you belong to Jesus, then work to live like him. Strive to live like Jesus. We're to be like him. Jesus is our example for life and for living. Once he saves us, he expects us to move to, to grow toward being like him. It's important that we do that. And if our Lord is our example, if Christ is our example, we're to follow him and to follow that example and we become more like him. So first we learn that we're to serve like Jesus. Like Jesus washed the disciples' feet and said, I gave you an example to follow, serve like I serve. Last week we talked about praying like Jesus, praying primarily for God's will to be done and to put feet to our prayers, to act on those prayers as we love Jesus. Well, this week I'd like to look at a familiar trait of Jesus one that we are familiar with, we're to love like Jesus. We're to love like Jesus. So so let's consider what that means. Of course, um, 1 John 15, 12, and we'll look at a number of verses in John 15, and in this part of John 15, if you have your Bible, you might open it there. But Jesus says, this is my commandment that you love one another. How? just as I have loved you. Not just that you love one another, but you love like I loved, that you love one another just as I have loved you. And if you open your Bible there, you can see that he repeats that in verse 17, not quite all of it, but he says, this I command you, that you love one another. He's serious about it, and we're to love the same way that Jesus has loved us. How many of you know that Jesus loves you? How many of you have seen his love for you over and over again? How many of you know that if you love like Jesus, it's going to change you? It'll change us a lot. This is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. So he commanded us to love one another, to love one another. He also commanded us to love our neighbor like ourselves, even to love our enemies. You know what we're supposed to do? We're supposed to love like Jesus. That's what we need to be doing. Jesus didn't have any problem loving so, so then how, how do we love like Jesus? How did Jesus love? How can we learn to love like Jesus? He commanded it, so what do we do? Well, most of us, the first thing we would point to if we say, how did Jesus love? How does he love us? We would point to the obvious. Jesus loved us with a cross. He loved us by going to the cross and dying for us. And we know lots of verses that point that direction. Probably the best known verse in the New Testament is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's his promise to us. God loved us so much that he gave his son. Jesus loved us so much that he gave his life. Jesus loved us with a cross. He died on the cross 
so that we could live. Another verse that we're familiar with, uh, Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love. He shows his love for us, toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus loved us and does love us through a cross. 1 John 4, 10 says, this is love, not that we loved God, but he loved us. And he sent his son, Jesus, to be the propitiation, the perfect sacrifice for our sins. That's how much God loves us. That's how we know that Jesus loves us. He is the perfect sacrifice for us. And then back to John 15. John 15, 13, Jesus said, Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And you know what Jesus did? He laid down his life for you and for me. He laid down his life on the cross. Jesus loved with a cross. If we're going to love like Jesus loved, then we've got to be willing to deny ourselves to take up our cross daily and to follow Jesus. Love like Jesus. That's what we're supposed to do. How do we start that? Well, you start by trusting Jesus for your salvation, going to him. I'm a sinner. I'm broken. I need you, Lord. Will you forgive me? Will you transform me? I want you to come into my life and change me. When we do that in faith, he promises to save us because he has loved us through his cross. Once we've given our life to Christ, then then we follow him Even if it's costly, even if it's difficult, we follow Jesus. We take up our cross and follow him. We want to love like Jesus. But Jesus did not just love by the cross. How else did he love? Well, Jesus loved by sharing the truth. Sharing the truth. You know, it's it's showing love. It's loving someone if you share the truth. 1 Corinthians 13, 6 in the great love chapter says, love does not rejoice in righteousness, but it rejoices with the truth. Sharing the truth is important. That's where love comes in. Jesus shared the truth with us. He shared about sin and its consequences, and he shared about righteousness and justice. He shared about grace and mercy. He shared about love, about God's love, about his love for us. Jesus shared that love. And of course, Jesus said, if you know the truth, then the truth will set you free. If you know that truth, if you are shared with, that truth is shared with you and you believe and you trust, then it'll set you free. Jesus shared the truth. He did it in love. And in fact, that's what the Bible tells us we need to do. Ephesians 4.15 says, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. We're supposed to share the truth in love. That's part of what we're supposed to do. And if we're going to be like Jesus, that's what we will do. Speak the truth in love then we're loving like Jesus loved, and we're growing in Christ. Uh, The Life Sunday School class was talking about that this morning from Colossians, growing in Christ. That's what we're supposed to do. Part of that is by sharing the truth in love. Jesus was constantly sharing the truth with his followers, with his disciples, always sharing in love. Again, back in John 15, verse 15 says, no longer do I call you slaves, Jesus says, No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all the things that I've heard from my father, I have made known to you. Jesus sharing truth with his followers, with those that he loved. He loved them, he loves us, and we can love by sharing the truth just like Jesus. Folks, if we love others, we'll share the truth with them in love, in a loving way. You know, if you say that you love someone, but then you lie to them, or if you say that you love someone, but you withhold the truth from them, you aren't loving them very well, are you? If you see a car coming and your friend's about to step out into the street, if you share the truth with him, that's love. If you withhold the truth and let him step in front of the car, that's not very loving, is it? If you know the truth, if if you know where to find food and your friend is hungry and you withhold the truth, if you just, and not that you lie to them, but if you just don't tell them the truth, that's not love. Jesus taught us to love by sharing the truth. And if you know the truth about Jesus and the cross and you withhold that truth from your family and friends, from those who are lost and need Jesus, then you don't really love them at all. You may say you do, 
but you prove that you don't really love them. Jesus loved by sharing the truth, and he taught us to do the same. So Jesus loved by sharing the truth and by going to the cross to save us, but Jesus loved in other ways as well. You know, when I think of Jesus and his love, like many of you, I I think of the way that Jesus loved gently and passionately, like Jesus loving the children when he said, let the children come to me. Don't keep them back. Jesus loved the children. I think of him in that way. We think of Jesus telling those disciples, permit those children to come to me. Don't you keep them from me, but you let them come. I think of Jesus with a a smile, loving his disciples and sharing good news with them, teaching them with warmth and with joy. But there is another side of Jesus' love that I want us to consider this morning. And this is really the emphasis of where I wanted to go this morning, a little different approach. Jesus loved passionately and gently. He loved with warmth and and compassion, but he also loved through discipline. He also loved through discipline. Jesus, after all, is the one who made a a whip and he cast, he drove the money changers out of the temple. And that's pretty rough. How can that be love? If Jesus is love and if he should, how can that be love? Well, it's love in several ways, on several levels. For instance, it shows his love for his father and his father's house because treating, treating the temple with disrespect was disrespecting the father. So it was because of Jesus' love that he, drove them out. It demanded strong discipline. It also shows not just Jesus' love for the Father, but his love for the common people, for the people who were coming to the temple to to worship and to pray. Uh, That's what the temple was made for. My father's house is supposed to be a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of of robbers, he said. The buyers and the sellers in the temple, they were creating a a barrier to free worship. They were creating a a wall that kept people from full access to God. Jesus loved common people like you and me. He loved us. He loved them enough. Well, he loved them far too much for to let greedy money grabbers keep the common folk from God. Jesus loved the Lord and he loved people. But cleansing the temple shows another kind of love as well. It shows Jesus' love for righteousness and obedience to God and to his law. Those who were selling and the priests who were profiting from those sales, they were walking contrary to to God and to his law. Jesus and his love for the truth. Remember, he shared the truth. That's part of how he loved. Jesus' love for the truth and his love for righteousness, his love for God's commandments, He wanted true believers to know how important it is to love God through obedience. In fact, Jesus in John's gospel comes out flat and he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's how love looks. So Jesus' love, even as he drove the buyers and the sellers from the temple, it showed real love, not not just for them changing their direction, but for God and for people and for God's law. Jesus' love is gentle when gentle is called for, but Jesus' love is never without discipline, never without discipline. And I like Hebrews 12, verse 6. Hebrews 12, 6 says, For those whom the Lord loves, He disciplines. That's a good word. Say it with me. For those whom the Lord loves, He disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. If Jesus loves you, he won't leave you wallowing in a pigsty of sin. He won't leave you there uh, without love. He will love you with grace and mercy, but he will also love you with discipline when you stray, calling you back to, to righteousness and to faith. Who are examples of that kind of love? Well, take Peter. Did Jesus love Peter? Absolutely, Jesus loved Peter. He often took Peter and James aside for deeper, richer understanding, for communication and and discussion. Jesus showed extra love with Peter, for instance, in in Matthew 16, when when Peter confessed Jesus as as the the true Christ that came from God. He, He let us know that Peter would be the one who would lead his church, be the leader of the disciples. Jesus even met with Peter after he rose from the dead to meet with him on the seashore and said, Peter, do you love me? 
There was no doubt that Jesus loved Peter, although Peter doubted it because of his sin, but Peter was doubting himself, not doubting Jesus and his love. Yet did Jesus always treat Peter with that loving, gentle kindness? Not exactly. You see, there was a point when when Peter told Jesus, Jesus said, I'm going to Jerusalem to die. That's what I'm going for. And Peter said, nope, we're not, no, Lord, that's not going to happen. And you remember what Jesus did? He rebuked Peter and he said, get behind me, Satan. He said, back off, Peter. You're out of place. You're wrong. You mean Jesus was harsh even with Peter when he loved him? Yes. Because remember what we told the, the kids earlier? If you love somebody, sometimes no is a word of love. If it's straightening us out and keeping us from going the wrong direction, if it's keeping us from running out in the street and getting run over, no is a good word. Peter, get behind me. Get behind me, Satan. See, Jesus loved Peter. He loved Peter deeply, and he followed Peter, uh, or Jesus loved Peter, and and he disciplined him when he was out of place. You know, in in Matthew 18, a few chapters after Jesus told Peter he would be the leader, Jesus talks about about church discipline, and it says that if if your brother's in sin, you go to him, and, and you reprove him, you rebuke him so that he can change. If he doesn't listen, you go with one or two others. Again, to, if, if they don't listen, even then you take them before the church and, and you treat them as an unbeliever. Why do you do that? So that you can be mean to them and mistreat them? No, you do that because you love them and you want them to come back to a right place. You exclude them for a while so that they will realize what they're missing and come back to Jesus, come back to faith. That's what discipline is all about. So we know that Peter, that Jesus loved Peter, but he was willing to to discipline him, to tell him no, to speak even harshly to Peter. Who else might be a good example of Jesus and his love, and yet love and discipline? I think of a woman who was caught in adultery. You remember the woman who was caught in in the very act? You remember the, the Jewish leaders who brought her to Jesus? She was despised and unloved, unwanted, uncared for. She was not loved by the people. But Jesus even loved those who were despised and unloved. So when, when, the, disciple, when the, the woman was caught in the very act of adultery, thrown at, the, at Jesus' feet, thrown on the ground at Jesus' feet, and, and the Jewish leaders had picked up stones to stone her and put her to death, you remember what Jesus did? First he knelt down and he rode in the dirt, but eventually he said, hey, the one of you without any sin, you cast the first stone. And they all eventually dropped the stones, dropped the rocks that they had, and and walked away, leaving the woman and Jesus there alone. Jesus said, are there none to accuse you? And she said, none, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I accuse you. Jesus was without sin and could have accused. But Jesus instead forgave her. In love, Jesus forgave her. Did Jesus stop with forgiveness? Did he stop with saying, I don't judge you either. I don't condemn you either. As I recall, he said, then neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. Jesus said, your life hasn't been what it's supposed to be. You change, you repent, you change, go and sin no more. You see, Jesus spoke with discipline. He said, I don't condemn you, but but you need to change your ways. Isn't that sort of what parents do when they discipline us to tell us we need to change our ways? It's what our Father does. It's what Jesus does in love. Love against what many in the world say. Love does not mean acceptance of sin or acceptance of lies. It doesn't mean that I accept what you do. Jesus didn't accept what she did. It's love in spite of the lies, in spite of the sin. It's calling out that love or calling out that sin, forgiving the sin, but saying, okay, let's go, let's repent, let's go and sin no more. Love, at least Jesus' kind of love, always, always calls for repentance when it comes to sin 
and for a walk in righteousness, that we should walk as he walked. A Jesus kind of love never comes without discipline, always comes with discipline, to put it in a positive way. Well, not only did Jesus love with discipline, but he actually showed us, taught us that we need to love with discipline too. He did? Yeah, he did. Jesus taught us to love with discipline. I mentioned already Matthew 18, where Jesus talks about loving the sinner, going to them to get them to come back to the church. But there's another example that comes to my mind, and and I want to share it with you. Jesus teaches about our need to love others with discipline. In this case, I'm thinking of Matthew chapter 7 in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, verses 3 through 5. Jesus tells about a friend with a speck in his eye, a speck of dirt or a speck of grit. Any of you ever had something get in your eye that you couldn't get out? You know what I mean? Wow, two of you have had something get in your eye that you couldn't get out. I'm glad for the rest of you. Uh, It seems like every time I go out and mow with this nice spring weather and a little bit of wind, have you noticed the wind? Something blows back into my eye, and sometimes I just, I can't get it out. Now, I don't know, you're maybe better than I am, and you can always get it out. Uh, I'm afraid sometimes I'm going to pluck out my eyeball trying to do that. It's no fun grinding into your eye and itching and scratching your eye. It's painful, and it's irritating. It's agonizing. Yeah, some of you can almost feel it, can't you? Ugh. It's there in your eye. So what do you do if you can't get that speck out of your eye yourself? What do you do? Well, you ask somebody who loves you. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to ask somebody who means, say, hey, will you help me? Ah! You know, no telling what they would do. But you ask somebody who loves you to help you get that speck out of your eye. If you can't get it, maybe they can. In this case, Jesus is talking more about a sin problem than he is about a piece of dirt or a piece of grit, a character flaw, but he's illustrating it with a speck in the eye. So Jesus says there's this this person with a speck in the eye. In this case, Jesus speaking to the friend, not to the one with the speck in his eye, but to the friend who is there and is willing to help with the problem, maybe to fix it for them. Jesus says, okay, you, you can help them, but make sure you get the log out of your own eye. Make sure you get the beam out of your own eye before you try to stick your finger in their eye. You know, if you got something big in your line of vision and you're trying to poke in somebody's eye, it probably isn't going to be helpful or fun. It's probably going to cause more pain and issue. So Jesus says, deal with your own sin and your own shortcomings before you go poking your finger into somebody else's eye or into somebody else's business. It's about discipline. He says you practice self-discipline. Take care of yourself before you try to discipline another, before you deal with them and their issues, their sin. Jesus says take care of the beam that's in your own eye before you worry about the speck in their eye. But too many people stop there. So you're not supposed to judge me. Take care of your own business instead of worrying about my... How many of you have said something like that to somebody else? Mm Mm-hmm. I think there are several of us who have done that, but the truth of the matter, Jesus doesn't stop the story there. Jesus says, you take the log or the beam out of your own eye so that you can help your brother with the speck in his eye. You take the beam out and then go and help your brother. You mean we are supposed to help them? We are supposed to help with discipline with with a brother? Yeah, absolutely. If you love them, you will help them deal with their issues in life but you won't go poking around without taking care of your own issues in life. That's part of how we can love like Jesus. We help others in their sin and their difficulty and their pain and their hurt. We help others because we want to love like Jesus. So what about a couple of practical ways to do that? Well, how can you love like Jesus? You know what I'm going to say first, just like I did with the kids. Share a hug! Do you think Jesus always kept people at a distance and wouldn't wouldn't share with them? I think not. In fact, when I think about Jesus and hear about Jesus, you know, he touched the blind man. He touched the leper when everybody thought that was a horrible thing to do. He held the little girl's hand and he said, "Uh, Talitha kum, uh, get up, arise. Jesus touched others. He loved others with a touch. We can love each other with a hug. You know, I really like a hug. I can point to five places in Scripture that says, greet the brethren with a holy kiss. And I mean, I love you all, 
but I don't need to kiss you. I can hug you. That'll, that'll work really good for me. Maybe even a handshake, but a, a touch, a warmth, a pat on the back, it helps. Love like Jesus. Maybe love with a hug sometimes, with a warm touch. How else can we love like Jesus? Well, encourage one another. Encourage a brother. Encourage a sister in Christ. Be the person who lifts someone up who's struggling. Help them when they're hurting. Be the one who gives hope to the hopeless and help to the needy. Be that person. Be an encourager. Encourage them. Then you'll be loving like Jesus. Well, how else can we do it? Well, what about this one? Support one another. Help them up when they're falling, when they begin to falter, when they need a hand, help them up. Be like Jesus when he reached down and, and gave a hand to Peter to pull him out of the waves. When, when Jesus was lifting Peter in the stormy seas, be the one who helps and who rescues, who supports another in need so that you can love like Jesus. And be the one who will challenge another, challenge one another. You mean when I start to stray, somebody who loves me will tell me and challenge me to get back on the right track? Yep, that's pretty much it. You remember the rich young ruler who came to Jesus? He came to Jesus. He wanted to follow Jesus. He said, what do I need to do to receive e eternal life? What, what do I need to, to enter the kingdom of God? And Jesus challenged his belief. He challenged his system. His challenge for the rich young ruler was to deny himself and to give up his, his money, his goods, and come follow Jesus. We need to deny ourselves and take up our cross to follow Jesus. Maybe not to sell all that we have, but, but we got to get things that are holding us back out of the way and follow Jesus. Challenge one another. Uh, we like the verse in Proverbs talks about as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Challenge one another. Encourage one another. Be there to, to, to help encourage toward a, a right, right behavior. The rich young ruler didn't like the challenge that Jesus gave, and he walked away sad. And it says that Jesus grieved. But Jesus was challenging him to, to be the right way, to go the right way. If we're going to love like Jesus, we'll challenge people who need the truth. And, of course, where it's necessary, if we're going to love like Jesus, we might even have to rebuke someone else, to call out their sin in order to lead them toward repentance. Jesus did not get after Peter because he hated him. He wanted Peter to change his direction, to use, use Scripture to do that. There's no better way than to do that. Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all Scripture is God-breathed. It's inspired by God, and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God can be adequate and equipped for every good work. Or cheated and gave you verse 17 too. God's word is a good way to encourage, to rebuke, and, and to correct another. If we love like Jesus loves, we'll be willing to rebuke another. All of that is about sharing together in discipline. In discipline. If you love someone, you'll share with them with regard to discipline. And Christian discipline is never a one-way street. You give discipline toward others as they need it, but you also receive discipline when you're out of line. That's what Jesus' love looks like. Sharpen one another. Be accountable to one another. Love like Jesus. Now, friend, if you're going to love like Jesus, start at the cross. That's a good place to start. It's where we started today. Start at the cross. Give your life to Christ. Take up your cross and follow him. Be saved, but then walk with Christ. If you're going to love like Jesus, then share the truth with others. That's what Jesus did. Learn the truth so you can share the truth. You know, there are a lot of people who spout all kinds of things. Have you ever looked at the internet? People say all kinds of things. Is it all truth? Is any of it truth? Well, I hope some of it is, but a whole lot of it isn't. You got to learn the truth to share the truth. So learn the truth and share the truth with others. Share the good news. The best truth of all is, is Jesus came to, to die for our sins. He, he was buried, but on the third day, he rose again to give us life and eternity if we'll turn to him and trust him. Share the good news. Don't withhold God's truth from those who need to hear it. If you're going to love like Jesus, love with discipline. Don't just love with, with warm fuzzies. Love with discipline. 
be disciplined yourself, and then you can help discipline others in love so that they can be more like Jesus too. Jesus' love wasn't all warm smiles. Sometimes he was saying, no, that's not the way to go. That's not living according to God's law, God's will, God's way. When that was the case, Jesus knew that love requires discipline. Sometimes Jesus' kind of love is a tough love. Sometimes it doesn't feel very much like love. But loving with discipline is always a love that makes a difference. To be like Jesus, you got to love like Jesus. Anything less is not really love at all. Will you bow with me in prayer? Dear Lord, thank you so much for Jesus and his love. Lord, sometimes we get caught up in an idea that love is, is all about having fun and warm and, and being kind and gracious. Sometimes love, though, is, is hard. But Lord, I pray that we might love with a love like Jesus' love. Father, I pray that when it comes time for discipline, that would receive that discipline. And Lord, I pray that if there's even one here today who says, you know what, I know that Jesus loved me. I know he gave his life on the cross for me. But I've never really given myself to him and, and become a Christian to walk with Jesus. It's, it's time for me to do that now. Father, if there's one who needs to come to you, I pray that today would be the day. There's no better today day than today. Now is the time of salvation. Help us, Lord, to respond to you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing an old hymn as our response and our time of invitation today. I found a friend, oh, such a friend. Uh, if you need to make a response to Jesus, if God is calling to you, you know that Jesus loves you, but you need to get some things right with him, either to get your life straightened out with him and be saved, or maybe as a Christian say, I, I'm not doing what... God wants, I'm not doing all that God wants me to, but I'm ready to change. If God is calling to you, then will you come? As we stand together and sing, I found a friend, oh, such a friend. It's hymn number 183. If you have your hymnal, uh, use your hymnal.